All right, we got Dancing in the Grave of Concord from Legendary Drops. Are we dancing on the grave? Yes, we are. We are dancing. Graves of failed games. Yes. I am. And I'm not going to pretend like I'm not. I'm doing it with glee. Dancing on the graves uh, of, of like failed products. It didn't used to be a thing because if you look back in the day, everybody was disconnected. Nobody had internet. Uh, everyone w couldn't really tell like what was a good product, what was a bad product. Every just, everybody just ate whatever what was in front of their face. Uh, as far as products go, you know, there was that whole line of as seen on TV products. And, you know, sometimes they're still sold at Walmart. I'll like walk by in there and see some shit. And there is an audience that is will always be just disconnected from the rest of society even though they like still participate in it um and so it'll be that target audience that specific products will just be aimed towards and there's nothing wrong with like aiming your product at a specific audience there's nothing wrong with that at all but you have to also acknowledge that if you make a product everybody is gonna see it Everybody is going to either love it or hate it. And the whole grave dancing thing. <laughs> this is just something that I think has only happened recently uh, within the games industry. Uh, to see a, a certain game or any type of game that comes out with a specific agenda and to see that game not sell people just love it uh, I mean there's no beating around the bush it's just it is what it is I love to see it Concord two weeks after its launch already shutting down 200 plus million dollars up in smoke good on in a moment I love to see it you know we live and as far as grave dancing goes, this is about all it will ever be. It's like everybody on YouTube is going to make like one video and be like, good. And that's about it. That's about as much grave dancing as you will probably get from, you know, all the public figures and whatnot. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, also, there have been a lot of other, like, if you look at the history of like patents and products in the US and like consumer goods. I think there have been just a metric shit ton of just failed products, but you don't see a lot of other products getting grave danced on because those other products didn't come out with a specific purpose to send a, a specific message about some stupid social issues, regardless of whether or not the, the product was good or bad. Um, yeah. We live in a really odd time. We've seen some games that have blown up wildly successful games coming from lesser known studios and oftentimes mm -hmm. even first time developers and at the exact same time we're seeing triple a studios fall flat on their face yeah making games for modern audiences but yeah you hear the word modern audience you should probably not play that game in the end it's just a lower quality product of lesser value that yes. doesn't really speak to any audience more times than not, they're representing ham-fisted attempts at propagating an ideology rather than mm -hmm. just making a valuable product, a good game. Today, what I want to do is I want to talk about people's perception, the industry's perception, as well as our perception on why games fail and succeed, because it's a really heated topic right now. Oh, that is a good topic. Why do games fail? Why do games succeed? That's kind of a hard one, kind of an easy one. Uh, it's hard to say because certain games, games will come out and they will have like a specific reason for making a game. Either the game thinks it has good gameplay, the game thinks it has a good soundtrack, the game thinks it is very just artistic, the game is just cozy, the game thinks it's a good simulator of a thing. There's a ton of reasons why a game is successful or a failure. And I feel like this is the best moment to have that conversation.
We've seen breakout successes like Baldur's Gate 3, Pal World, mm-hmm. Helldivers 2, Stellar Blade, and Black Myth Wukong, where none yeah. of these games are coming from well-known established AAA studios. Hell, two of these games are coming from studios that it was their first time release. Yeah. All the while, we've seen failed releases like Redfall, Suicide Squad Kills the Justice League, Concord, mm-hmm. and even seen considerable pushback on the... There's actually way more than he's like talking about the games that have just failed flat on their face quality of highly anticipated titles like Starfield and Diablo 4. The conversation around what players want, why games fail, and why games succeed has grown to a fever pitch, and I think it's due to just how polarizing the last couple of years have been. Yeah. In the history of video games, we have never seen two back-to-back AAA releases where one breaks concurrent player records mm-hmm. and the other one removes itself from existence within two weeks of its launch. <laughs> That is actually hilarious to think about. One video comes out, breaks tons of records, sets itself up as like the number two most played game on Steam. And another game comes out. It shuts down two weeks later. That is the definition of polarizing. Black Myth Wukong broke 10 million in sales three days after its release. And... Concord barely could muster 25,000 units sold. With the direction that the industry has been headed and how many people in both game development and games media seem to want to completely ignore the elephant in the room, it was only a matter of time before the levy broke and a moment arose where players' expectations and the expectations of the industry would come into contrast so greatly that it's impossible to ignore. This- oh, that was... I didn't even realize that was... Concord gameplay. I couldn't even tell. It looked like any other generic shooter. Stark contrast between Black Myth Wukong and failures like Concord underscore a deeper disconnect in the gaming industry. It's not just about the financial metrics or the immediate reception of a game. It's about understanding truly what players want from their games and why some games are failing to hit the mark. These issues highlight how critical it is for publishers to align their efforts with genuine player interest. I'm going to say this again for the people in the back because apparently they're not listening. Genuine player interest and high quality execution rather than relying on formulaic approaches or misguided attempts at relevance. I don't think the formulas are going anywhere. What I think is that the formulas aren't sophisticated enough uh, is what I think. the, The formulas will probably not go anywhere. But it's just going to be up to you as a consumer to figure out, do you, li- do, you want, do you like the formula? Do you wish there was a more complex, more nuanced formula? Or would you rather take a gamble uh, with a new game studio and have them come out with something, you know, like Black Myth Wukong or Helldivers or, or some no-name game company that just comes out with a, a banger game? All right? Two... Two sides of the coin. As the industry has continued to evolve, it's become increasingly evident that the traditional markers of success, big budgets, high profile marketing campaigns Mm -hmm. and strategic partnerships are no longer a foolproof indicator of a game's potential. Which is so funny because a lot of the essentially what he's talking about is you can't just throw money at it and just make a good game. With something as so complicated as entertainment and what makes good or bad entertainment good or bad game it uh, it's like a multitude of things it's like you got good animation good graphics good sound good gameplay good systems good storytelling good characters uh, uh, everything it's so complicated instead what we are witnessing is a shift towards valuing authenticity innovation, and a deeper understanding of players' desires. Games like Baldur's Gate 3 and Pal World have set a new standard because they delivered an engaging experience that tapped into the core of what players were looking for in games or may not even have known that that's what they wanted. Yeah. While others have been faltering... Yeah, Pokemon with guns. Who'd have thunk? ...by missing that crucial connection, chasing trends like looter shooters or appealing to the beliefs that are only held on Twitter. From my perspective, Concord failed at the perfect moment. Not only is it the contrast with Black Myth Wukong's success and the successes of many other games as well, but yeah. this was eight years in the making. Hundreds of millions of dollars invested into this game. Sony came to that studio, sat down, played the game, and said, 
no, we're not going to publish this. We're going to buy you. Like they're Willy Wonka or something like that. <laughs> That's how out of tune they are. That's how disconnected they are from reality. Oh, from yeah. The reality of... Why would you think that any AAA tippy top leader is connected to like anything sort of gaming there's no way unless they're like out there on their own like personal twitter like actually playing games and like making like little reviews and shit like that there's no way those motherfuckers are, are connected you know down to oh, uh, oh i'm like a, a super rich millionaire and i'm so connected with you fellow kids fellow gamers hello guys Hello, my fellow gamers. Do you do you guys like this? Do you guys like live service? Do you guys like loot boxes? Do you guys like daily challenges, weekly challenges? Oh God, <laughs> I know you do. So that's what I'm gonna make for you. <laughs> what players actually want and what they're interested in today? You would think that with all of the successful games that we've seen over the last few years, it would be painfully obvious what's going on, what players want, and what we're the most concerned with. Inflation's higher than it's ever been. Games are $70. We don't have that much time or money to invest in games to begin with, so these games better be worth the money when we spend it. So our expectations are higher than they've ever been. And if you're not going to deliver a product on those expectations... Apparently, the expectations, depending on the game franchise, I would say are varied. I still have friends that are balls deep into Madden. And they buy all those microtransactions. <laughs> what do you think his expectations are for the next Madden? And he says he's been a longtime fan of Madden and have and has been buying those games for years. Wh wh where do you think his expectations are? are? They like way up there? They kind of in the middle? Or are they down low? He still plays Call of Duty. He's bought in like so many Call of Duties. But what do you think the expectations of uh, are the expectations of a Call of Duty fan? You think they're going to come out with some drastically different changing game mechanics? Oh my god, you could sprint backwards and side to side and diagonal reverse and oh, it's so game changing. Patience that meets those expectations, then you're going to fail. Your game's going to fail. And you're not going to sell anything, just like you did with Concord. For some odd reason, both games media and the games industry are trying to make sense of this, acting like it's some type of mystery, and it's not. We're telling you in plain English, we don't want it. But that doesn't stop them from yep. getting lost in the weeds that are social politics. It and they're going to keep getting lost in the weeds. The only thing that is going to be their little guiding light is the lack of sales for any of these games that come out. That's going to be their guiding light. Their little North Star. Or, in this case, a black star. Like a black hole. Oh, they're going to pour all this money into this game studio. Eight years development. Oh, this is awesome. We're, we're messing with... We're, we're building this game... Everybody's got their pronouns. Everybody looks like a weird alien that is so unrelatable. Or I don't know what the heck was going in, the, in these guys' heads like with like this dude. Is this a dude? I don't even know. I'm just assuming his gender. <laughs> and the thing that's going to guide the decision for the next game is just what are the sales? What are the profits? How many units did you sell? That's going to be the guide. In recent years, the discourse surrounding social politics has increasingly permeated the gaming industry, influencing both the creation and receipt. Because who doesn't love social politics? Social politics, everybody loves talking about this. Because nobody's got anything better to do. Exception of games. The terms woke and anti-woke have become touchstones in the discussion around successes and failures, reflecting on how Personal ideologies and cultural commentary are now woven into character designs, narratives, and gameplay. And just to be clear, uh, social politics is very like surface level uh, conversation stuff. Uh, the real mechanics of what makes countries go around, businesses go around, 
are the boring laws, the boring paragraphs, the boring thick booklets of do's and do nots of a city, of a country, uh, of, a, of a branch of politics. Those are the actual mechanics, but nobody's making games on those. They're, uh, they're, they, that, would, that would be pretty boring, to be honest. But, but what's more fiery? What, would, what gets more uh, eyeballs on screens? Oh, let's talk about some social issues. That's so relatable. Oh. Meanwhile, uh, everybody that's playing video games and going through life uh, are being affected by uh, laws that they don't even know that they are being affected by. This ideological infusion has led to a polarized audience. Who would have thought that would be bad for video games? Where some players are now celebrating the progressive elements and inclusivity while others criticize perceived agenda-driven content. The resulting divide has not only sparked heated debates, but it's impacted sales, as games are now seen as too politically inspired or, conversely, too disengaged from contemporary issues may alienate significant portions of their audience before their game is even released. This ideological entanglement highlights how crucial it is for developers to balance their... <laughs> He said entanglement. <laughs> Anytime somebody says the word entanglement, I can't help but to think of that Will Smith, Jada Pickett Smith interview. <laughs> oh my God, entanglement. <laughs> Their creative vision with broader audience expectations. <laughs> I came across an article from Forbes. It was written by Paul Tossi titled the woke war why the right believes it's dominated gaming and tv in 2024 what the woke war why the right believes it's dominated gaming and tv and what no wait what is this title why the right believes the woke stuff has dominated gaming and tv is that what this means or right believes that the right righty stuff has dominated gaming and tv in 2024 I don't really know what this article, I don't know. In the article, Paul writes, as someone who is painfully plugged into online discourse to the point I may soon just need to go live in an Arctic cabin somewhere. Uh, you could easily just stop looking at your phone uh, like a normal adult. How about that? I have borne witness to a narrative this year in the media landscape, namely across movies and TV, where Right-wing media consumers and influencers believe they have defeated woke games and shows and those who support them. While claiming win... No. People believe they have defeated bad games. Not woke games. Bad games. Bad games don't deserve a platform. Good games do. If it just so happens that a good game has a little bit of woke stuff in it, then great, fantastic. But if a bad game uh, has like some woke stuff in it, ah, uh, it's, it's bad because it had the woke stuff. And it completely ignoring the, the game mechanics, the story, the gameplay. And that's the reason why it's bad. Not the, not the gameplay, because it's woke. No. Ends of their own. I feel like there's a new one of these that comes up every month, and I figured that it was time to break down the per I mean, if this dude thinks that we, that I said we, but like, I, whatever. Gamers have defeated woke games. That is not the case. I, I, gamers have defeated bad games. And you know what? Gamers have been just defeating bad games for many years now because they they are constantly popping up if we were defeating them back in the day or you know there what was it there's like a specific year that everything started to just slowly decline and become bad i don't know what year that was exactly but for like the last five-ish years maybe more there have just been more and more bad games so if this dude thinks that we defeated games like back then, why did they keep coming out with bad games? You think this is the end? You think just because Concord failed, there's not going to be another one, another Hydra head to take its place, like two more? No, of course there's going to be more. 
take its place. This is not the end. I mean, and it's so simple, defeating a bad game. You just don't buy it. <laughs> you don't, you pay it, don't mind. That's it. <laughs> Perception of what's going on here and the reality of what's happening. Successive anti-woke things are claimed as scalps, whether that was the actual intent of the work or not. Failures of woke things are purely because they're woke, not because of any other reason at all, ignoring any and all other factors. Mm, at least he this happens that. every time, and it's time to add them all up here and show what's going on. Prepare the cope and seethe, as they say. All then goes in to break down each success and failure over the last year. Starting oh. with Suicide Squad kills the... There has been more games besides just the past year. Justice League saying, Perception. This was a woke version of the Arkham universe in which characters like Harley Quinn were more conservatively dressed than previously. No. Nobody stopped playing Suicide Squad because Harley Quinn was more conservatively dressed. That is not the case. People don't like Suicide Squad because it's another dog shit live service game that just wastes your time. Did we think about that? And there were things like pride flags hanging out in the base headquarters. A consultancy agency named Sweet Baby Incorporated was used in the development of the game to advise on making things overly inclusive. Well, I can't really argue with him on that point because Sweet Baby Inc. clearly has a reputation for doing things in games and changing things for their own specific reasons, completely unrelated to gameplay or story, all for the sake of inclusivity. And when that happens, everything in the game feels forced, contrived. Uh, it feels out of place. And I think gamers can sense that, to be honest. And when they do, you know, everybody comes out with their little review and they just don't want to waste their money. Reality. Suicide Squad failed mightily because it was a live service game after Rocksteady had made its entire fan base devoted to single player superhero offerings and not a particularly good one at that. It was a goofy concept giving all of Task Force X members the same guns, few differences in powers and aborting the storyline halfway through to do a live service concept which featured dozens of Brainiac copies. All based on an IP with one critically savaged movie and one box office failure in the DC Extended Universe. Supposedly, woke critics scored the game a 60, one of the lowest major scores of the year. Okay. Concord, Perception, a hero shooter that failed because its heroes were not attractive enough and they were virtue signaling by putting pronouns into their select screen. Reality. <laughs> Concord started its development right after Overwatch launched in 2016. And Damn, that's kind of crazy to think about. that. They started... This game thought that they could compete with Overwatch. And it took them eight years. Overwatch came out with a whole new sequel. Brand new. And they still couldn't compete. <laughs> Arrived to the shooter landscape dated with an ill-conceived $40 price tag in a free-to-play landscape and failing to meaningfully stand out from its competition. Concord, just too late to the party, dude. People are already tired of hero shooters, ability shooters. People are already tired of that. I mean, look at... Let me see. Let me see. Steam. I came and spell. Steam. Charts. Overwatch. Dose. Oh, Overwatch is doing not too bad. 56k? Ish. And then, then you have to account for people that don't play on Steam and only play on uh, the Blizzard launcher. So there is that. So like, I don't know. What, like 100, 150k? Ish? 24 hour peak? I'm just guessing. I mean, Overwatch ain't doing that bad. Its character designs were poor. And this game wanted to cut into the pie. They wanted a piece of the pie. 
for, not for hotness reasons, but because of a lacking aesthetic that other games with plenty of similarly sized and aged characters had done better. Supposedly, Woke Critics scored the game a 65, lower than all its multiplayer rivals. Stellar Blade, Perception. The game was a big hit for AAA newcomer Shift Up because it embraced the idea that real gamers want attractive women in their games and they were provided plenty of fan service outfits to fulfill that desire. Reality, Stellar Blade was a solid action game on the whole and reviewed well among video game journalists, drawing an 81 on Metacritic and heralded as a great first effort from Shift Up. Where was all this energy that you get from uh, oh, whatever this game was? Where was all that energy for uh, for Bayonetta? That main character is even more uh, like like crazy, crazy looking. Where was all that energy then? Helldivers 2. Perception, a game about killing bugs and bots without woke agendas. It was a celebration of the kind of patriotism the left fails to embrace in the modern era. Reality, the entire game is based on Starship Troopers, a very clear, famous skewering of those very concepts. Mm -hmm. Journalists scored the game at 82, and it has been in conversation as possible, if not likely, Game of the Year shortlist candidate. I don't think I've ever seen a game go through such two-sided love or hate relationship like so much between them and the community as hell divers too game first comes out oh everybody loves it oh, we're nervous some shit everybody hates it review bomb it okay uh go back uh or actually before even that uh fix the game server get me off this dog shit screen that i'm stuck on for like a couple hours okay they fixed that Great, everybody loves it again. Nerf some shit. Oh, everybody hates it. This is dog shit. Come out with a... The game came out with a great battle pass system that you can just complete in, in its entirely of even like the free version and the premium version of the battle pass simply by just playing the game and collecting the currencies. Everybody loves that. Constantly come out with like new uh, little call down doodads, whatever it was. Great, everybody loves that. Nerf the shit out of a uh, a bunch of mechanics or a bunch of good guns. Change the meta up because simply everyone you realize everyone's playing the same weapons and and shit at the tippy top. Oh, everybody hates that. That's stupid. Oh, you now you have to a couple months go by. Uh, you got to make a PSN account. Oh, everybody hates that. Oh, that's stupid. Okay, we're not going to do that. Everybody loves that. But we're going to take away the game from like 144 countries. Oh, everybody hates that. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Helldivers 2 has been one of the games that has just been like, everybody hates it or loves it. And right now, everybody ain't liking it. And then there was like the whole like Discord thing where some of the, ga the, the game devs are on their shit talking to player base. Everybody hates that. <laughs> and then they nerfed all the all the like fire effects from guns. Everybody hates that. That's stupid. You're making the game hard for no reason. It's for the sake of balanced meta in a PvE game. Everybody hates that. That's stupid. What are you doing? <laughs> the first descendant. Perception. The PvE hero shooter is full of attractive women, which is responsible for its surging popularity. And its live plan so far has been to introduce more attractive women to ensure its ongoing success. Reality, the game succeeds mainly because it's a well-structured looter with meaningful progression systems and endless targeted farms. It struggles with RNG, however, and the game has seen a precipitous player count drops down from 265,000 on Steam to 40,000 in a couple of months. So its long-term future is uncertain. Yeah. Black Myth Wukong, Perception, Games Media wanted this game to fail based on an IGN article that discussed sexism within game science in the... Bro, Wukong has uh, had so much bullshit uh, go along with it. It's hilarious to see, like, so many game journalists just completely try to use everything to their advantage uh, to simply make a game look so bad. There's, like, a mistranslation... Uh, within the gaming journalism article or something that like one of these guys came out with 
they they mistranslated an interview. Uh, what else? They got supposedly extorted by Sweet Baby Inc. because they didn't want their uh, consultation services uh, for like seven million dollars or some shit like that. They're like, no, we're good. <laughs> There's been so much shit to try to ha stop the success of this game. <laughs> Past and its success is a blow against woke agendas. Reality, the game is an absolutely crushing massive hit in China where no one is... Absolutely crushing massive hit in China? You don't think there's no one in the U.S. enjoying this game? Really? Really? <laughs> Press X to doubt. ...considering any of these controversies when purchasing. Again, games journalists scored this game a very positive 81. Yeah. Paul concludes his article with, The mental gymnastics here are always one of the following. A game considered woke fails, and the reason is because it was woke. A game that succeeds must not be woke, or its woke aspects can be explained away as not really being woke after all. A game considered anti-woke for some perceived reason, and it being anti-woke is the reason why it was a hit. A sentence or two from a single review or a specific tweet means that all woke journalists or players love or hate something. So he mentions all of this mental gymnastics that people do uh, on whether or not a game is good or bad, woke or not woke. And you can only do this for games that have probably came out within the last, I don't know, five to six, seven, eight years. Because if you go back a little bit further than that, there would be a ton of games that have came out that could easily be misconstrued as woke by modern day terms that have been massive successes back then. So this is only a modern thing uh, and was not an issue back then. Thing. You know, believe it or not, I actually really enjoy a lot of Paul's work, his writing, as well as some of the work that he's done here on YouTube. But with that said, this is a gross oversimplification of what's going on. I understand the desire to want to throw everything into a box because you see everybody else is doing it over on Twitter. But you have to look through the veil of social politics to see what the real concerns are. And there are real concerns here. Like the direction of these games and what's motivating the direction of these games. It's all for profit. These people don't care about you. They don't care about how you identify, what color your skin is, what gender you are, where you're from in the world. They care about money. You think some C-suite executives sitting out there thinking, how can we make our games more inclusive? Well, they are, but they're thinking about that because they're trying to make more money. I think mm. that the industry today has grown to the point where with as much money that's out there, with as much money that's in these companies and investors that are in these companies, they have to figure out how to grow their audiences even larger than they already have. And now we need more money. Guys, we don't got enough money in our pocket. We need more money. And the only way they can do that is to try to go after audiences that they don't already have. But the problem is, is that by infusing these ideologies within your games, what's going to end up happening is you're going to polarize your audience and split them. So you're going to end up you're going to end up selling a heck of a lot less games because of it. Because now you're dividing your audience rather than keeping it whole. Paul's not mm. wrong. He's totally right here. These games did not fail because they were woke. These games didn't succeed because they weren't. They succeeded because they were great games. They failed because they were bad games. But you're still ignoring the elephant in the room, which is that there is a lot of ham-fisted, poor, emulated representation in some of these games that honestly makes a lot of these communities look terrible. Yeah. And at all of the political characters are stereotypical. There is no one unique at all. Everybody is a stereotype. At the same time, when you're seeing that, you're also seeing a lower quality product that is not delivering on a customer's expectations. It's not delivering on the price that these games are being sold for. So yeah, players are going to start calling it out because it's hard not to see it. 
I remember, this is so long ago. It's a tangent. I'm sorry. But with that said, I was watching a Netflix series years ago. Uh, Sabrina, the remake, Teenage Witch, right? I, I remembered watching it when I was a kid. I was like, oh, this is interesting. The character was really pretty. So I was like, hey, let's check this out real quick. I like, you know, trashy television from now and again. But who don't? In the show, there was who an doesn't? episode where one of the characters wanted to be on the boys' basketball team and basically, like, pushed this one kid down the stairs, almost killed him, put him in the hospital. And there was no moral to the story. It was, you know, if you don't get your way, hurt people. You get your way by force. You got to force it. That's That was the moral. If you don't get your way, cheat. And I'm like, I sat there and I'm like, how are you supposed to be okay with this? How are you supposed to think that this is entertaining television? It's not. It's just odd pandering from people that have no idea how to represent characters with any depth whatsoever and just want to tokenize them. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. And it's happening in video games. And it's hard not to want to call it out and be, hey, that's bullshit. I don't want that. Nobody does. When you have reviewers... Yeah, I, I mean, I think he's got a good point. Nobody wants to be tokenized. Nobody wants to be painted with the broadest brushstroke. All right? People are a little bit more complicated than that. And... Uh, I don't know. It's like these guys have no idea how to make a good character. It seems. Make anybody interesting outside of their... Who they like to sleep with. And how they portray themselves into the world. Those are literally the only two personality traits. That are out there that are saying Black Myth Wukong, a game with anthropomorphic animal characters, is not diverse or inclusive enough. What are we talking about? <laughs> I, I get what he's saying is, oh, because there's like one, one or two lines of dialogue in a review that, you know, now all of a sudden these journalists are woke or whatever. Look, man, I'm just saying, why are you even talking about it in the first place? And to act like it's only a one-off case is ridiculous because it's everywhere. And there's so much pushback against the concerns, the genuine concerns of players and what the media wants these games to be, what the industry wants these games to be. At the end of the day, you're asking for our money. We don't have to give it to you. Yeah. Asmongold recently reacted to one of my videos on Black oh, Myth Wukong, and he agreed with me that games are both art and a product. However, he noted that the art can't override the importance of the product. That art and the expression of the beliefs of the developers can't be more important than what the customer wants, and he's right. When I look at games that have failed, I see a lot of pandering to an un- And I think that's a pretty good point that he brings up. Art being more important than what the audience wants. And I think this is like uh, a big issue when it comes to uh, just stories in general. Uh, I know this is like a thing in movies where when you make a movie, and this is just what I hear from directors, there is the ending that would happen in reality and then there's the ending that the audience wants. There's the ending that could be what the director wants. And they could all be like different styles of ending. You know, it's, you, know you take the hero's journey. You know, uh, you get like some loser who gets shit on for most of the movie. And then eventually he overcomes his fear, his thing, his mental thing. He defeats the bad guy and he gets the girl. That's the hero's journey but it's understandable that that can be formulaic and takes on like many shapes and forms in different uh you know in different movies and whatnot and you could kind of see it uh from each different you know genre of movie you know like the adventure type like lord of the rings or something like that uh the hobbit what else star wars or at least old star wars or something whatever um and this is like, or any Disney movie, really. This is like a thing that is what, like, what makes a good story? Is it, is it the thing 
because some stories could be good. Uh, like what makes a good, like, what do you think it makes a good story? Is it the, the story that ends with what would happen in reality? Like a lot of movies, the bad guy never wins. Although there's a couple that, you know, the bad guy wins, but they're few and far between. Where, or do you think what makes a good movie is whenever there's a satisfying ending, something that the audience can latch onto and have a little bit of closure. Does that make a good movie? I mean, because if it doesn't make a good movie, then your audience is going to be mad that they're not satisfied. All right, that's a bad movie. I'm not satisfied. I'm not going to go see the next one. But to, to, to like what audience? If your audience is like directors and like movie makers, then yeah, that movie could be great because it was with a twist. Surprise, Fight Club. The dude's schizophrenic. Oh God, it was him the whole time. Didn't see that coming. identified audience and that's the root cause of these issues there isn't anything wrong with wanting to be inclusive or diverse but that's not what we have in games or media today we have pandering and tokenism we have self-righteous studios writers and actors that lack the talent and vision to be able to portray characters tastefully and holistically they can't make inclusive and diverse media because it's not intrinsic to them as people it's forced in Final Fantasy 16, there's a character named Dion, and he exemplifies a tasteful and holistic approach to representation. Dion's character is woven into the narrative, not as a mere token, but as a fully realized individual whose relationships are integral to the personal story and broader plot. He is not some retconned, gender-bent character painted in rainbows. His representation avoids reducing his identity to a single facet. Yeah. Instead, presenting his same-sex relationship as a natural and meaningful aspect of his life that contributes to the overall depth and complexity of the story. I never actually played... What is this? What did he say? Final Fantasy 16? I never actually played this, but I don't know. Maybe I'll uh, consider playing it. They didn't make Dion who he was because they wanted to send a message. They wrote him like that to add more quality to the narrative. It's painfully obvious, and they're just ignoring the elephant in the room at this point, but they are trying to force something onto an audience, whether they like it or not, because they want to make a statement. But it's just not the way to go about it. From my perspective, this shows a severe lack in priorities that likely is bleeding into the rest of the game and its development. There is a direct correlation between these games that are poorly mimicking representation and wholly uninspired products of lower value. But... To be fair, uh, I would also say, yes, Overwatch has some lore and story behind it, but I would say for the most part, the most players have no idea of anything that goes on and as far as like Overwatch lore goes. Like people don't play Overwatch for the lore. They play it for the gameplay. I wouldn't expect Concord to have a good story by any means, all right? It's like a fighting game. You don't play a fighting game for the lore, for the story, even though some of them can have good stories and, you know, you know, campaign modes or what have you. You know, look at some of the Mortal Kombat's or uh, what was the, the DC one? It was based on, like, the MK engine or whatever. That one was pretty good. Uh, Street Fighter has a story. Tekken has a story. But you don't really need to know it. Uh, it's just, why would you try to ham fist a good story into a game genre that is really hard to tell a story in? And gameplay is the driving factor behind this type of genre. They do not know who they are making their game for, and as a result, they don't know what game they are making. Just last week, an article dropped from PC Gamer that was titled, The Eagerness to Grave Dance on Unpopular Games Has Become a Bad Habit. And in Well, stop making bad games, and we'll stop dancing on the graves of bad games. Because nobody is dancing on the grave of a good game, because that just doesn't exist. The article, Tyler Wiles is talking about the 
failure of recent games and how social media celebration of it doesn't add anything of value, nor is it telling the developers what's wrong or why people don't like it. You sure about that? They wrote, the jubilation over Concord's low turnout, it apparently cracked the top 50 bestsellers on PlayStation Store over the weekend. It's a little <laughs> bit too late there. Derived some degree of I told you so sense of justice, the idea that out of touch, creatively bankrupt executives are cynically chasing trends and the rest of us would have. I mean, it is. The game was chasing a trend. The game was trying to take a pie slice out of Overwatch. It was. It's a live service. And you had to pay $40 for it. What a joke. I've had the common sense to avoid releasing a Concord, a Marvel's Avengers, a Suicide Squad, a Gotham Knights, or that perplexing Gollum game. <laughs> the perplexing Gollum game? <laughs> oh, even this, whoever wrote this, it was even like, the, doesn't even know, I have no idea about the Gollum game. <laughs> Gollum cannot catch a break, <laughs> even by the defenders of those of the bad games. <laughs> but it's not actually that easy to know why one game succeeds and another one doesn't. But what he, uh, I mean, you can kind of take a good, like an educated guess. Like, let's not play stupid. He doesn't understand and apparently the rest of the industry doesn't get is it is just that easy to see when these games fail why these games fail yeah. and how to prevent it each one of these games had players scratching their heads well before their release telling developers what they didn't like about these games yeah. suicide squad was a blatant live service cash grab giving guns to characters that don't even use guns just to be able to sell weapon skins it's <laughs> open world design story character design Gameplay and UI were all under fire well before that game ever came out. Oh, Concord man. quite literally is a creatively bankrupt trend chaser. Yeah. I'm sick and tired of these game developers and games media trying to tell us that the sky is green. Anyone, apparently, except them, could have seen these games fail well before their release. Oh, yeah. Hell, some of us were making videos saying they were going to fail well before they even came out. I mean, as far as Concord goes, <laughs> people were saying that game was bad in, what was it? The paid beta and the free beta. <laughs> it was bad both times. And I'm sure there were critiques in each of those. But who knows uh, whether or not the devs listened to any of the feedback, what changes they made, who knows. Everybody is sick of the same tired, worn out game releases. The trend chasing, the pandering, the poor quality, the price, and having people finger wag at us because we're talking about things that we don't like or saying that we're not interested in a product. Players should be celebrating when these games fail. It's a lesson to the industry to show them what we don't want and say why we don't want it. Notice that none of the games that failed were good games, while the games that succeeded were indeed just good video games. You can chalk it up to social politics or oversaturation all you want, but at the end of the day, it's quality authenticity and value that speaks to players nothing else you know just before making this video i saw a tweet that had popped up i think it's deleted now it was from power world's community manager and he was talking about how sad it is to see the state of things how toxic things have become how players celebrate the closing of studios or people getting laid off or games failing and also uh take this into account what you see on the internet can be overwhelming, but it is not the majority also. There are people that play video games that don't really interact online, that don't have a Twitter account, that don't go onto the discords. And I think that amount of people, percentage or whatever, are, are just the greater. You know, it only takes a cut, like maybe a handful of, uh, you know, YouTubers or streamers to make it seem like something is louder than it actually is. So, I mean, you could be a loud, uh, you could be a vocal, honestly, you could be a vocal minority for or against a game, to be honest. 
and talking about how hard these developers work and how this doesn't do anything good for the industry when we talk like that, but I don't care. And I think it does. Ultimately, I do think it has a positive impact on the quality of the products that we receive at the end of the day, because I think that in a lot of cases, these developers forget that we are customers, not your friends. Simple as that. It's not that I want to see you fail. I want to see you succeed. I think that's where they get it wrong. I want to see them succeed. But when you do something that we all know that you shouldn't be doing, that's when I want to see you fail. Mm. And I think that, I think that's the other thing that they don't realize either, is that that's why players are upset. Many of these studios are studios that made some of our favorite games of all time. Many of the studios that I've seen fail over the last few years have made games that I'm so surprised that oh, that's yeah. the direction that they're going in and it's not a game for me anymore and I just don't buy their products. And it's those game studios that gamers used to latch onto, and it made it feel like we were more than customers for those old game studios. The old game studios that back in the day, they were like a single A studio, maybe a double A, had no reputation, but then they came out with a banger. And then they came out with banger two, banger three, banger four. And then all of a sudden time goes on and all of a sudden now they're a triple A company and they have the formula. And then they come out with another game and it's not a banger. And then what little attachment I had for a name brand, I no longer have anymore. 90% of the games that I play today are indie. Because the vast majority of AAA products just don't speak to me anymore. And it's not an age thing. It's not aging out or anything like that. It's just that they're making games for an audience that I just don't think exists. You're not the target audience anymore. You're just, you're just not. And you have to be okay with that. I really don't. And these products that they're putting out, these games that they're making are wholly uninspired, so contrived. It's unreal. Mm -hmm. Yet you're asking for the exact same amount of money as you always have. Or you're saying... Or you're asking for more. Or you're asking for anywhere from $70 to $130. That you need to increase the prices. You're frustrated. Do you think because they, in some cases, double the price? Do you think they're doubling the value delivery? Do you really think so? Did we're frustrated. Why wouldn't we be? This is our one form of entertainment. This is the one thing that we get to look forward to. I mean, there's other things to look forward to, but you get what I'm saying. It's for a lot of people, this is their favorite hobby. This is the one thing that they always look forward to. They're always talking about with their friends. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, watching game reveals or pre-ordering games don't pre-order games that. <laughs> but you know people are excited for these games and it's it's a gleam of hope in some people's lives that are relatively bleak and when you stop making games for them yeah they're gonna be they're gonna be upset man they're gonna be really upset we look to you guys as the ones that are supposed to be out there innovating and making games that are filling a gap in the industry that we didn't even know needed to be there in the first place we didn't even know an experience like that could even exist. Baldur's Gate 3 came out and it made a ton of players that had never played a turn-based RPG before mm -hmm. fall in love with a turn-based RPG. Dang, I gotta Start play that. a bunch of other turn-based RPGs and CRPGs and stuff like that. Pal World gave players an experience that Pokemon would never give them. Black Myth Wukong gave us a game that broke down cultural boundaries and made gaming, honestly feel a heck of a lot more inclusive than it ever has, at least on a global scale. Helldivers 2 brought the boys back together. Yeah. Gave us a really cool experience in a game and a theme that we didn't even think would even exist today. Yeah. the For the little bit of time I played with Helldivers, it was fun. Like, even though one of my buddies didn't really like shooting games, and the shooting mechanics were so-so, in my own opinion... You know, we had like another grinder buddy. We had another buddy that just like playing it for the sake of playing it. And, you know, we all came together and it was fun. That's what we're looking for. Do better. Make better products. Make things that are worth our money. 
not yeah. our empathy. That's it. Anyway, that's all I got for the video today. If you guys enjoyed nice. the video, make sure to like, subscribe, drop a comment down below, share it with your friends. Follow me on Twitch if you guys want to catch me live. Outside of that, I'm going to play some more Core Keepers before I go to bed. Uh, I got videos next week that are probably going to be on Risk of Rain, Core Keepers. Probably going to be playing a little bit of Warhammer 40k. Noise. Anyway, stay cool, stay righteous, stay safe, my friends. And uh, look forward to another video as well. Oh, shit. Family. 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 <laughs> Oh my god, that's just so funny. Are we Bro, this fucking outro, that's the funniest shit. Him and that other dude that has like, just the draft outro. <laughs> Those guys are fucking hilarious. But um... Grave Dancing. Grave Dancing will continue on top of bad games. It will not stop. If a bad game comes out touting that it is the next best thing, and it comes out and it's bad, there will be grave dancing in the form of uh, a couple videos and that's about it. All right. <laughs> but other than that, <laughs> I think this is a good video brought up a lot of great points. Um, I don't know until, so I don't really have to say uh, much else besides until the next bad game comes out, keep grave dancing. All right. Uh, Catch you guys later. All right. Peace.